I can't remember how it goes. Hello, Dolly. Uh, something, something. It's so nice to have you back where you belong. <laughs> okay, we're showing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Looks like we're live on YouTube. And, uh, oh, Dolly. Let's see it's how we can make so it going live on Dolly. Facebook. It's so nice to have you back where, back where you are. Yeah. <laughs> You're looking swell. Dolly. I can tell. <laughs> Dolly, <laughs> you're still showing, you're still glowing, you're still growing strong. Okay, now I gotta mute. There. Okay, we good to go. I think we're live. We are. Even Robert, Robert, yes, says we're live. Okay, perfect. Uh, looks like we're okay on Facebook. Still a little choppy on Facebook for some reason. We are latently live. <laughs> latently live. <laughs> Okay, let's get started, I guess. Uh, so good evening, everybody, and welcome back to our uh, offering of Sunday Night uh, Outreach, the Sunday Night Astronomy Show. First of all, uh, I would like to uh, welcome back Mr. Paul Owen from, uh, RASC member Paul Owen from uh, Moonshadow Observatory in Hampton. <laughs> I was waiting for that. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got uh, Mr. RASC member uh, Mike Powell. <laughs> From, from the DFO <laughs> Observatory here in St. John. <laughs> and Emma says, don't quit your day jobs. <laughs> Thank you, Emma. <laughs> uh, okay, so we're all back here anyway. Uh, tonight, this folks, day job. this is... <laughs> okay, see if we can get things going here. Uh, tonight, folks, we've got another mixed bag of astronomy topics here for you again tonight. Um, we'll be starting with a little bit of a talk about what's up in space this week. Then Mike... Or, I don't know, am I going to give a talk first, or is Paul going to give a talk first? Have we agreed, guys, or? I don't know. We'll figure it out when we get there. Okay. Well, one of the talks tonight <laughs> will if be. Mike, uh... You can go first. Yeah, right. here you go. I'll, I'll, I'll go first. Okay. Mike is going to give us a talk about uh, how to <laughs> oh, bring baby, an old. <laughs> All right. Should we should we hang up and go again? <laughs> we'll probably end up doing that anyway with the way we go with the show. Um, Mike is going to give us a talk about how to bring an old telescope uh, back to life by giving it a wrap. Not a whap, but a wrap. <laughs> um, I'm uh, also going to show you a couple of pictures of my 12-inch daub here behind me, a uh, little bit that I modified on it using the same technique as Mike is uh, using, although I had somebody else do it for me, uh, and a few other things I did to it as well. Uh, Paul's going to provide us with a discussion around choosing the proper scope for shooting photos. Uh, we've also got, uh, we'll be taking a look at our newest Shoot the Moon contest coming up uh, starting on Tuesday night uh, with some nice prizes and a bit of a twist to winning this, uh, this uh, contest. And of course, we'll have your wonderful photo submissions as well. And then we'll take a quick look at the rest of the night sky treasures for the week. Uh, Paul also has a book to uh, offer tonight uh, as a prize. Hey, Paul, just a second now. Let me get clicked on you. Look at the book that Paul has to offer. Ooh. Thank you, Vanna. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Vanna. Perfect. The book and... didn't show up on Facebook. Oh, didn't, oh, didn't? Hang on. Let's do it again. I'll just show up. Watch this. Here it comes. There it is. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Astrophotography. Wonder why. <laughs> yes. Teach yourself uh, astrophotography. That's there you go. Uh, and then we'll take a quick look at the uh, rest of the night sky treasures for the week, if we get time for that. So uh, another pretty full show on the way for you folks. So sit back and enjoy. And remember, uh, this is live broadcast. So if you have any questions about the night sky, we're happy to try and answer them for you here. Aren't we, guys? Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's get started with a little bit about what's new in space this week. That'll be for me, I guess. So I guess i got to share my screen, first of all. Uh, share screen. I think I'll share this one. And we're going to get those pile of windows. Ooh. 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 And let me get the right file. Uh, this week in space, these guys. Okay. Well, let's open that photo. And let's we'll see if we get it up on both screens. Hey, look, I think it's going to. Ooh, what's that? Oh, wow. Well. Well, Betelgeuse's odd recent dimming was caused by a huge cloud of material that the supergiant star blasted into space, a new study suggests. 
The bright star Betelgeuse, which forms the shoulder of the constellation Orion the Hunter, is about 11 times more massive than our Sun, but about 900 times more volume, vol, voluminous, voluminous, vol, voluminous, yeah. <laughs> volumes. <laughs> that, that speaks volumes. That bloated condition shows that Betelgeuse is near death, which will come in the form of, of a violent supernova explosion. Well, in the fall of uh, 2019, hang on now, blah, 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 this one. In the fall of 2019, Betelgeuse began dimming significantly, losing about two thirds of its brightness by February. This dramatic dip spurred speculation that the star's demise may have been imminent, perhaps just weeks away. From our perspective, anyway, Betelgeuse lies about 500 light years from Earth, so everything we're seeing in the star today happened actually centuries ago. But the dramatic sky show didn't happen. Betelgeuse is powered through the dimming episode <clears throat> and returned to its normal brightness by May of this year. Now, the recovery sparked a new round of speculation, this time about the dimming's cause. Some scientists attributed the doldrums to a light-blocking dust cloud, for example, whereas others said it was big star spots on Betelgeuse's surface that were likely to blame. A new study bolters the dust hypothesis, but adds a twist. Betelgeuse itself apparently coughed up at the cloud. The research studied, researchers studied the star in 2019 and 2020 using NASA's iconic Hubble Space Telescope. Hubble's observations from September to November 2019 revealed huge amounts of material moving from Betelgeuse's surface to its outer atmosphere at tremendous speeds, about 320,000 kilometers per hour. During this three-month-long outburst, Betelgeuse lost about twice as much material to space from its southern hemisphere as it normally does. The superhot plasma, or electrically charged gas, cooled considerably after traveling millions of kilometers from Betelgeuse condensing into dust grains and forming a light blocking cloud. And then about a month later, the south part of Betelgeuse dimmed conspicuously as the star grew fainter. So, is the mystery solved? Well, we're not sure, because we can't tell, because that was 500 years ago. So that's the story on Betelgeuse. What well, they hurry up and wait. We'll have to hurry up and wait. Next story we've got is the, the iconic Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico has gone dark, at least for a little while. One of the telescope's supporting cables snapped in early Monday morning on August the 10th, ripping a 30-meter gash in the giant radio dish, according to the University of Central Florida. The observatory has been shut down while engineers assess the damage and formulate a fix. The 300-meter-wide Arecibo got up and running in 1963. It was the world's largest single-dish radio telescope until 2016, when China's 500-meter aperture spherical telescope claimed the mantle. Arecibo has done a wide variety of work during its long life, from tracking and imaging near-Earth asteroids to listening for possible signals from advanced alien civilizations. And its communication attempts have not been all one way. In 1974, scientists used the uh, Arecibo uh, or Arecibo Observatory to to beam up the pictorial Arecibo message towards M13 or Messier 13, which is a globular cluster that lies about 25,000 light years from Earth. It contains about 500,000 stars. The observatory's fame, um, and hang on now, let's take another look at the message. So that message was the one that was beamed out there. And here's what it's supposed to mean, I guess. So the top row is the numbers 1 to 10, reading right to left. The second row is the atomic number of key biological elements. The third part is the formulas for sugars and bases in nucleotides of DNA. The fourth section is the double helix of DNA. Vertical bar indicates the number of nucleotides in DNA. The next one is the human figure, height of a human uh, at the right and human population on the left. And then the solar system with the Earth displayed upward right there. I guess we're seeing this on, uh, we're seeing it on Facebook as well, are we? Okay, so, yeah, we got and, it, yeah. uh, okay. And then the uh, la uh, the last one is the Arecibo dish with the diameter of the dish there listed at the, at the end. Now, as an alien, we're supposed to be able to look at that and understand it? Well, of course. 
Not like a guy <laughs> jumping on a trampoline who got his head stuck in a flower pot. <laughs> <laughs> or that could be that too. That still proves that there's that that we're alien life of some kind, right? So I guess so. <laughs> maybe maybe not intelligent life, what they were looking for, but yeah. It was like the record we sent out without sending a needle or something. That's about the same, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, next up, uh, let's take a look at a third story. We've only got two more. And that's this one. I uh, want to see things, uh, what things are like on the space rock tens of millions of kilometers away from Earth. NASA has you covered. Right now, the near-Earth asteroid Bennu is about 290 million kilometers away. And with, with it is a NASA spacecraft called OSIRIS-REx. The, uh, the probe will attempt a difficult goal this fall, snatching a piece of space rock to bring home to Earth. And it takes me a second to get my photos open. Sorry, folks, but actually, I think I can just go this way. Hey, look at that. Hey, there it is. <laughs> <coughs> That's what those arrows are about. <laughs> so before the big day, OSIRIS-REx is practicing its moves, and the resulting footage is just as cool as you'd expect from a piece of machinery that flew just 40 meters above a rubble-covered uh, space rock. That height is the equivalent of standing on the roof of an 11-story building and looking down. So there's the height of Bennu, the size of Bennu compared to the Empire State Building and the Eiffel Tower. But instead of toy cars and ant-like people, the camera on board OSIRIS-REx saw only rocks. Nope, oh, wrong slide. This way. Um, on October the 20th, OSIRIS-REx will make a similar descent, but travel 30 meters farther, ready to grab a souvenir from among these rocks. Well, that sample will land here on Earth in September 2023, if all goes well according to plan. Scientists will then study the asteroid rubble for clues about the solar system's history and the role that the carbon-rich space rocks, uh, like Bennu, may have played in the rise of life on Earth. So, that's all we got to say about Bennu. Now, and finally, next topic. Let me get to it. Here it is. Not sure what that one is, huh? Penguins may, might be good at hiding from humans, but they can't hide their poop from giant satellites circling our planet. Oh, no. <laughs> I do it. Uh, so new imagery revealed penguin poop stains. Let's see if we can get a look at them here. There, there they are, right in there. New imagery revealed penguin poop stains on the white blankets of the coldest continent. And those dark spots suggest that there are nearly 20% more emperor penguin colonies in Antarctica than previously thought. This is both good and bad news, as all of these new colonies are located in areas that are likely to be highly vulnerable to climate change, according to the study. It's not easy to count just how many emperor penguins there are. Uh, that's true. Let me get back there to normal shot. Um, and it's not easy to count how many uh, emperor penguins live on Antarctica, as the animals typically breed in very frigid, remote, and difficult uh, to reach places. To get around this, for the past decade, scientists with the British Antarctic Survey have been searching for penguins indirectly by looking for poop stains on <laughs> in satellite imagery. There's some more. <laughs> what do you do for a living? <laughs> <laughs> there, look, see, there's poop stains. Look at that. <laughs> These images revealed eight new emperor penguin colonies and confirmed the existence of three other previously identified, bringing the continent's total to 61 colonies of emperor penguins. But most of the colonies were so small, the researchers had to use multiple images to confirm they existed. Those 11 colonies increased the number of known emperor penguin population by 5 to 10%, or up to 55,000 additional birds, bringing the total population of the world's tallest living penguins to somewhere between 531,000 and 570,000. Wow. And that's a lot of poop. <laughs> they gotta change their diet. They gotta change. <laughs> well, actually, they don't eat all winter long, so I don't know where to get all the poop from. But that's gonna make the ice dark. It's gonna attract light, and it's gonna melt the ice cap. Here, that's that's what ha that. There's where global warming starts, right there. There it is, penguin poop. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And that's all I get to say about that tonight. All right, so oh, let's uh, let's stop sharing here. Brownies on that cream. What's that? I wonder if Sidney Crosby's on that team. <laughs> uh, <yeah>, possible. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Montreal Canadian fans, here we go again. Uh, yeah. All right, 
Um, who wants to be next? Mike is. Mike is going to be next. How do you follow a penguin? <laughs> <laughs> <I> really? <laughs> okay. Let's give uh, it a little shout out here first of all to Robert. Andrew Wilson, good evening, Sighorn. Uh, Mary King, hi, Mary. Uh, Trudy's on. And Bruce Kasuji is on. Hey, Bruce and Charlie Lake. That's everybody on YouTube and on Facebook. We've got Emma. We've got Peter. Hey, Peter. Marilyn and uh, Sean Connors is on. Hey, Sean. Runs Storm and Weather Centers. Thank you, sir. Clayton Carr and Denise. And I guess that's everybody. So thanks for joining us, folks. Absolutely. And let's get back to our topic. So, Mike, I guess you're up next, hey? Eh? Yeah. Okay. So they, I hope they were there for the last topic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what I'm going to do tonight, uh, you know, you got your old optical tube and you want to do something with it, but everybody's afraid to take their telescopes apart. I'm not. Uh, what I would, <laughs> thought I would do is show you. <laughs> I got this uh, 10 by 50 finder and I was going to vinyl wrap it in front of you and show you how basically do a miniature version of vinyl wrapping a telescope. And literally it takes minutes uh large tube is going to take a little bit longer but it's a lot easier than you think so i'm just going to tilt my camera down here see if can you see that if not i will turn the light on yeah turn the light on it's a little dark there we go there Perfect. we go a little bright spot on one side but you you'll get the gist of it so what do you need to vinyl wrap your optical tube number one you need your optical tube you're going to need a pair of scissors to cut the vinyl wrap you're going to need a razor blade to do some fine cutting and trimming. Some isopropanol just to clean your tube with so you don't have uh, sticky finger marks and whatnot on your optical tube. You're going to need a nice lint-free cloth. You're going to need, it would have been a credit card, but I didn't want to show you my number. So a Princess Auto card or something that you can use to help spread the vinyl out. And of course, some vinyl wrap color of your choice. I got a chromy orange here and a kind of a flat orange. I'm going to throw the flat orange away and just do this one in the uh, almost a Celestron orangey orange. That's too bright, is it, to see the, the color of that? Um, no, we can see it. Your, can you tilt your light or move your light a little bit? See if I can. There, there that's perfect. Go. Great. That's better, right? Okay. Yeah. So the first thing I'm going to do would be is to disassemble the optical tube, which takes seconds here. You just unscrew the visual back, take your lens off, take off the focusing nut, or what I call the focusing nut. That's the, the one that basically when you put your lens on, you tighten it up, and then this one tightens up against it and holds it in place after you find focus. And you have just a plain aluminum tube. Not much to it. I think this one actually has a baffle inside, which is kind of cool. I'm going to take a little bit of isopropanol, put it on my rag. And all this is is to make sure that the adhesive sticks. There's not some grease on your fingers and whatnot. I just had chicken for supper, so I'm <laughs> I will have. You know, and I didn't wash my hands. <laughs> yeah, I, I put this stuff on, and uh, it's liable to slide right off, so. Just a quick wipe with some isopropanol to make sure that the adhesive on the vinyl wrap actually sticks. So you take your scissors, you find your piece of vinyl wrap, and you basically cut it to size. You make it a little bit big. If you look in the optical tube here, I've got it so it's, it hangs off each side a little bit, but it does wrap all the way around. And I don't mind if there's a little bit of an overlap here when I'm done. It doesn't bother me a bit. Some people don't like the seam. Uh, but again, in my case, uh, I usually hide the seam away from people on my scope or something like that. You don't even know it was there and you don't know it was vinyl wrapped. So the first thing I'm going to do is take the backing off. Be ever so careful not to get my fingerprints all over it. And lay it down and I'm just going to set the scope in the center. Now, getting this lined up is probably the single hardest part of it all. And it, it, if you don't get it dead on right away, doesn't matter. You can lift it off. And 
realign it again. Mike, just to, just to let you know, before we get too far in this, this yeah. is a family program, so the cousin might have to stop. The who? The, co the cousin. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> I'm going to peel, uh, there's an outer film that uh, basically protects the vinyl wrap. I'm going to take that off right away. And then as I slowly work my way around the optical tube, I'm going to take the credit card here. And I'm just going to work any lines or bubbles out of it as I wrap it. Now, this optical tube is not perfect. If I was going to spend more time on it, I probably would have uh, sanded it even further. But I'm not spending that much time on it. I'm just trying to get this quickly. And again, you can peel it off and reset it. So I'm trying not to get any wrinkles in it. You're going, really? He's done that three times? That's it. I'm not doing mine. <laughs> we'll send it to you. <laughs> so I just slowly work back and forth, either with a card or with my thumb. I find my thumb is easier. And I peel the adhesive off the back and slowly just work it in all the way around, making sure that I push any wrinkles out. You gotta remember I'm doing this in about six minutes. So <laughs> now you can use a heat gun if you like and stretch this if you have a, a handy person like my wife with you. She uh she pulls on it and I heat it. And it takes any of the lines and stretchy marks out of it. The whole goal is to make sure that you don't have any lines in it or bumps or dimples. You now we're about three quarters of the way around here. We got 90% of the, the wrap on it. Now, there's a little trick you can do afterwards as well. If you do end up with a wrinkle or a bump, you get yourself a, a nice pin and you just uh, poke a hole in where the vinyl is bubbled up and press it down flat. So for sake of expediency here, I'm just going to... When I did my 8-inch optical tube, it took me about 15 minutes to slowly going around the optical tube and working everything out, getting all the bumps and wrinkles and all that out of it. You can stretch it and pull it. Tug it, it'll stretch. That's what the, the, the good part about vinyl is it's uh, very forgiving to stretch and move around. I did a set of taillights on my car the same way, so. And basically there you get the gist of it. We've wrapped it. Most 90% of the wrinkles are out of it, and it looks pretty good, but we got too much at each end. Now, one end is threaded because that's the end that your uh, lens goes on. So what you can do is find out where the line is on the last thread, and I just take my razor blade. Can you bump the camera up just a bit, Mike? Follow it in the threads. Sorry. Okay. So it's in the threads. And the thread guides the razor blade around, and you pop off that section. There'll be a little bit of trim left over. That doesn't matter. And on the other end, I take my razor blade. Where do I throw you? And I just put a slit, and I start slicing right around the edge. And just a little bit of a 
a saw pattern as I'm slicing. And what that does is it keeps it right on the edge of the optical tube. So I have no access or excess, as they say. Now, there it is, it's wrapped. The simple part is you've got your uh, locking ring. Now the locking ring, when you take them off and look at them, I call it a locking ring because that's what it does as far as I'm concerned is it locks uh, the main lens. But inside you'll see it's threaded on one side and not on the other. That's so it can overlap the tube. So you put the non-threaded side on first and you screw it down. And it goes right over top of the vinyl. Look at that, like it was made for it. And you put your lens on. And then you screw your eyepiece back in. This is the one that's hard to get the threads back in the same spot. But once you do, it'll slide in nicely. Once you do, of course, this is probably going to take me 15 minutes just to get the... It's not the vinyl that's in the way. It's just getting these fine threads lined back up again so it screws back on. Everybody knows if you get the slightest bit of... Uh, cross-threadedness, you got yourself an awful mess. And there you go. There is one vinyl-wrapped optical tube. Nice. Nice job. It took, it took minutes. Like I said, you can still un unscrew your lens, tighten up your focusing ring on it, well, you know, set it at the window, get focus back on your object, and, uh, you know, you got yourself a nice looking optical tube again. It's all put back, nice color, nice and flat. People are going to think it's brand new. And so, can you use it like a hair dryer with it once it's done to take out some of them? Yeah, what I do is uh, I've got a, a heat gun, uh, but a hair dryer will do just the same. Once it's warmed up, you can sit there and take your credit card and just work any of the bubbles out of it, mm -hmm. like going back and forth like this. Or if you do have a nasty bubble that's there and you do an, uh, you can take a pin, poke a hole in it, and then flatten it out, and you won't even know it was there. You don't even see the pinhole. You just put a just a you know a, enough of a hole to, to let the air out, and then you can push it down with your thumb or credit card. And again, it takes uh, minutes, and that'll look like a brand new optical tube. So, now saying that, I've done it with this one right here in front of you. I don't know if you can see on this side. I'll just turn that. <laughs> there's my there's my c6 and i did the secondary scope on it uh not quite the same color but very 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 close yeah i can't so, tell from here uh and it turned out well and then of course there's the the scope from the 1980s uh this one here behind me uh that i refurbished i vinyl wrapped it in white put a couple of death star stickers on it and when you're doing uh, public observing, that, that attracts the crowd. <laughs> and it's different. It's not the same as everybody else's scope. It's just something that was real simple to do and kind of customizes your scope to you, right? Absolutely. So, and you see the Death Star. Well, that's what's going on in the background. It's the same thing. They're doing that uh, dive of death or whatever back here. Yeah, there we go. So, yeah, because Robert just asked that question. That's why I was laughing. What is the death? What is Darth Vader doing to the stormtrooper? <laughs> <laughs> If, if you've watched the show regularly, folks, you'll see that Mike always has a little something ha different happening in the back room with every show. So one of these <laughs> times we're going to award, award a little prize for the one who can pick out the, the, the moment. That's yeah, excellent, Mike. They're, they're doing uh, Dirty Dancing or whatever they call that the movie there with a he holds yeah, up yeah. here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> So that's uh, that's how simple it really is. I mean, you can buy the vinyl wrap at any any craft store, or you can order it online, or you can go down to uh, one of these places that makes signs, and you can buy vinyl wrap from them. Uh, any color of the rainbow, you like I said, you can uh, actually take a photograph, and they will print that on a, on vinyl wrap for you. 
and then uh, you just take your time. Uh, what's so nice about doing it on a C8 or something like that is because I have the uh, the Vixen bar underneath and it, and it hides the seam. <laughs> so you don't mm. see the seam. But that's the little tricks you learn. You don't want to put the seam on top. You want to put the seam somewhere where you you know you're going to hide it. Because uh, the, the, the whole look is to make it look like there was nothing ever was done to it. It looks like it's a custom paint job or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, it really makes a difference and gives that personal touch to your telescope that uh, nobody else has. Agreed. So where do you buy the vinyl wrap, Mike? Well, like I said, you can buy Michael's uh, is one of the places you can buy vinyl wrap. Uh, I buy mine online because I can buy it by the roll. Mm -hmm. uh, I usually get like a 12-foot roll. I think it's 144-inch by 24-inch wide. And it, it costs about 10 bucks, believe it or not. It's it's really inexpensive. Or you can go down to one of these uh, science places, uh, the people that vinyl wrap cars and things like that, and do, you know, they vinyl wrap the sides of uh, vans for advertising and things. Uh, they'll sell you the vinyl wrap. It's, it's all the same stuff. And uh, like you say, you can stretch it, you can heat it and stretch it and, and manipulate it in a million different ways. And it doesn't take very long to, to actually put it on and you know, turn your scope into something that looks brand new again. And uh, it's so, so simple. You just uh, got to step up and, and try it. And well, if it doesn't work, you feel you it it. What's that? Sorry. How much you charge to do it? <laughs> <laughs> I've wrapped a few scopes now, but no, I just wrap them. I don't charge. <laughs> but you know, if you're not happy with the job, too bad for you. <laughs> 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 you know, uh, wrap at your own risk, as they say. But, uh, you know, if you got an old scope or, you know, and the paint's all chipping on it or something, and instead of taking it apart and looking at painting it, uh, think about the option of going ahead and vinyl wrapping it. It's, uh, it's a real simple, simple thing to do. You saw I did this uh, finder scope in front of you in less than five minutes. You know, the, the more patient you are, the better the job is going to be like anything else. Mm -hmm. But uh, it is a simple, simple, really simple thing to do. And uh, like I said, you can look at that. You won't even know it was wrapped. It looks like it was painted and, and made that way. And that was just in minutes. So. so if you decide you want to take the vinyl wrap off, will it, will it hurt the paint? No, it should not. It's uh, the adhesive. It's not. Uh, I got the hood of my car vinyl wrapped. And the only reason I vinyl wrapped it was to keep the reflection of the sun off my face. Mm -hmm. And I was worried about with the vinyl wrap damage, the, you know, the, 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 the paint on my car and it does not it just uh you put a little bit of heat to it and it peels right off oh fantastic and there's no residue whatsoever and any little bit of residue there might be you can take an alcohol swab and and clean it right off yeah because i didn't want to do my car and then find out it's going to damage the original paint that was right. the, the whole reason of wrapping it was to keep the original paint underneath so i haven't uh, tried <laughs> taking it off anything myself uh well, uh, I did. I took it off a finder scope there about six, six months ago. And, yeah, you just you never even knew it was there. It just peeled off, and I rewrapped it again in a different color. I think I did it white. That's, that's awesome, Mike. That's uh, It's a great way to, to uh, give an old scope a new face for sure. Well, and it's another option rather than, you know, painting it or sending it out to have it powder coated or, or something like that. Yeah, and, if you're trying to match the paint yourself, you know, you yeah. never do. And you always, it looks like it's somebody trying to cover a scratch, right? Yeah, really. Yeah. And, and, and it does such a nice job. Like, it comes out so beautiful. Mm. Yeah. I'm going to just share a little shot there, uh, continue on with Mike's topic there. Um, you can find my photos here. Uh, so... I did kind of along the same line. I uh, I bought this uh, Mead 12-inch Dobsonian reflector telescope. Uh, when I received it, it had been uh, water damaged quite a bit. Um, the base was pretty well uh, destroyed. Uh, wouldn't support the scope, and uh, it needed some work. The uh, the actual the uh, what do you call that material, Mike? The arborite or whatever that's on the bottom there. Uh, it was peeled off, peeled back quite a bit. Uh, the poles were in, uh, marked up real bad. The top had, had a lot of other screw holes in it that uh, were used before. Um, so uh, what I tried to do was to change it out. This is, this is the, the scope disassembled. <clears throat> so I didn't really like the white anymore. I wanted to try to change to something else. 
So I uh, I had it re redone. There's the, the finished product. Yeah. Wow. So uh, I had the base rebuilt in a, in a light birch. Uh, it was painted for me. I had a carpenter do that up for me. Um, the poles, I had the poles taken off and the rings, top and bottom, uh, both sections, the top section here and the bottom section, were both taken, all taken off and powder coated black. Um, then I downloaded a picture from uh, Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, if you go to NASA's website uh, and just type in Hubble Images, uh, you can get the best, uh, the top 100 photos of, the, of, of Hubble that it's ever taken. So I, I captured that uh, a photo there and I downloaded it as a big TIFF file. I sent it to a local place called Science Plus, and they actually uh, applied decals to uh, to vehicles for commercial for commercial use. Um, so I gave them that image, and they weren't sure what I was looking for. But anyway, they actually oh, actually they were because I had been in before with my ten inch job <laughs> and yeah. had it redone. Uh, so they they gave me this image. It's called Westerlund Two, which is one of the more famous images. So it's an area of starbirth uh, that uh, Hubble uh, imaged anyway. And uh, Mike, of course, Mike gave me this uh, this emblem on the side. Um, he made this up for me. Fantastic job, Mike. Uh, yeah. it, it's it's actually me on my, my my little card that I have, or on, on my on my home page on Facebook. That's the actual image I use. But there wasn't anything that the scope was looking at, so Mike even put a little moon here in the corner for me <laughs> to, <laughs> to to lighten it up quite a bit. So uh, it uh, it's been a it's been a great scope. I'm having a little trouble with the uh, altitude clutch. Mike knows about that to break on it. Uh, but I've got get that worked out yet. But I've got a set of counterweights here too on the on the bottom side that uh, that helps support it um, because of the the large two inch focuser that I've got on the top. Um, and I I use two inch eyepieces in my finder up there. This is my light uh, shield, not a light shroud. I do have a shroud that goes around the two to block light levels out. I and uh, I guess if I zoom that back out. This is me at the beach at Saints Rest Beach, and there's the uh, there's the there's old the guy. Tenage, yeah. There's the tenage behind <laughs> it. Yeah. So that was the original. That was my original uh, daub back there, in the background. And Mike has that one now. And that was the base uh, again that uh, that I had to get rebuilt on this one because it was just it was not in good shape at all. I even took the uh, the clutch wheels off and had them powder coated too, so it all matched. I haven't flat blacked the inside yet, uh, which I'm hoping to do yet. I've got a tail rad on it and then and a uh, and the finder scope, uh, 90 degree finder scope, but that's what they look like the twins at the beach. So, well, what a beautiful uh, job they did on the final wrap too. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, they, I think they charged me a hundred dollars uh, for everything. It was yeah, it was a hundred dollars for the, the the wrap itself to take the image to put it onto a large sheet. The sheet was four feet by four feet, yeah. and uh, they wrapped it for me and uh, all for a hundred bucks or a hundred and fifty bucks. I'm sorry. Uh, and then they they gave me material that was left over. I got enough left over now to to wrap a couple of scopes there, like Mike Mike had shown earlier. So uh, the actual powder coating really worked out nice. I thought it, it it's now protected for lifetime. I mean, I mean because oh, I, I I set up at the beach, you know, the salt spray and all that kind of stuff that's that you get around the ocean. And we're of course sitting on sand, so you get all that abrasive stuff that can affect it. But with the powder coating, it's seemed to have been really good. But there's one thing in the background here. This is my astronomer's chair. I'm going to make one comment, just a suggestion. Do not buy a black <laughs> astronomer's chair. <laughs> Do not buy a black astronomer's chair. That's the next thing that's going to get powder coated. It's going into the shop very soon. It's going to get powder coated white. <laughs> I, All you hear is crash and profanity. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I had it set up in St. Martin's last week, and I tripped over it three times. <laughs> At the end of it, I, just, well, I folded it up, know, and I put it back in the car. I said, no. <laughs> well, no, if I remember correctly, I think it was either Mike or you who said, Something about getting those little orange lights at red lights at Princess yeah. Auto. Yeah. yeah. And that's what you should put on that. Strap yeah. it on them. Yeah. Strap it on them, yep. Like a vinyl wrap it to it. Yeah, we could. <laughs> <laughs> you could the leftover material I got, yeah, vinyl wrap it. But oh, uh, I would suggest a white <laughs> astronomer's chair. Really a, a better idea. Anyway, that's uh that's what I've got here. If folks are seeing a little bit of choppy video there again on uh, just making sure that uh, if it's choppy there on Facebook, I am working on some options here. Uh, we're about a week away from multicasting from one computer to uh, a server that is now set up, ready to go, that I'll be able to broadcast, simulcast out on YouTube and Facebook at the same time. And the computer will be uh, a little bit faster, which just seems to be my problem. I'm using two laptops that are not designed for this type of multi-streaming. 
Um, this is kind of something I just set up on my own. So I apologize if the if the video is a bit choppy on Facebook, but if you give me another week or two, um, I expect to have things much improved. So we'll be able to concentrate on the show rather than me sitting watching two monitors and two laptops to see if the connection's going okay. So apologies again, but uh, hope to improve this shortly. Anyway, that, what I wanted to do is get back to the fact that this is uh, this is an option that really does make a big difference in in the quality of your scope and it can bring it back to a fresh brand new scope again you know why why go out and buy brand new if you can take it and just re spend a little bit of money to rebuild it thanks mike for that yeah, yes fantastic I'm stop back out there again and Keep okay i'm trying to wrap some of my drums mike yeah Bring them on. When you Actually, turn your drums into a dub, we'll rock that, that, for that's, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that was just going to be my comment. You know I, I have a set of drums in the back now. I can do that with. Why don't we try? I <laughs> think it'd be, be cool. cool. I the, think Ludwig, it'd... the Ludwig telescope. The Ludwig dub. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The set of beaten sticks on it. Yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah. Well, that'd be cool if we could use uh, the sticks to make the trusses or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we could call it the lead frector. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, we're back to seriousness. Um, where do we want to go from here, Paul? We can either do your topic or we can do photo submissions or whatever you want. We can do your topic yeah, first, Nate. Uh, yeah, you we ready? might as well get that all out right. of the way. Sounds good. Yeah, okay. So, so so thanks I'll again, Mike, for all that. And uh, we'll click on Paul now. Set to go. All right, you let me know when I'm ready. You're ready, and uh, just <laughs> yeah, wait till when I'm ready. <laughs> okay, I fell right into that one. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Maybe oh, I better oh. wrap some hair in my head. Maybe that would be. <laughs> <laughs> or wrap it around that hat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I guess what I'm going to talk about tonight is just uh, very, very straightforward, simple stuff. I'm not going to get into anything real technical ever then uh, to talk about um, if you're going to be looking at a purchasing a telescope with the intent of taking some pictures of the night sky. Um, I just want to be able to offer up just a couple of things to look for um, so that you're um, getting the proper telescope for what it is that you want to do. Because a lot of people when they first buy a telescope think I, I got to go out there and get the biggest, you know, best telescope that I can possibly get. And then I can get all these beautiful Hubble pictures. And um, and I, in fact, when I started in the in the hobby, that's exactly what I had in my mind to do. And when I called up, uh, actually it was KW Telescope in uh, Kitchener Waterloo, Ontario, and Brian talked me totally out of it, and he put me on the right path. Um, because if I was going to take a great big telescope, and with all this mag, you know, this focal length and all this kind of stuff. Um, I wasn't going to be able to see very many things unless it was just going to be planets or some very small galaxies. And I didn't know that because well, I didn't want I didn't want to photograph that. I want to photograph, you know, the Andromeda galaxy and Orion and uh, and, uh, you know, the North American Nebula, all those great big targets. And uh, and I wouldn't have been able to do it. And he explained to me why. And that's what I'm going to do for you is I'm going to explain to you why um, wh whatever it is you want to uh, image why or what you should look for in a telescope. So if you look behind me, I've got this little telescope right here. And whoop, hold over here so you can see it. And this is just an 80 millimeter um, telescope, uh, which is a very small telescope. Um, it's very, very popular in terms of size. I'll turn it this way so you can see it better. And this little telescope here would give you a much better uh, image and a more complete image of, say, North American Nebula, the Orion Nebula, uh, the Andromeda Galaxy, the Double Cluster, uh, any of those really nice, big, beautiful targets, because it's a smaller telescope and it's got a shorter focal length. So just like in the camera world, if you're familiar with camera lenses, if you go with a shorter focal length um, camera lens, say, of 14 millimeter, well, of course, you can get a much wider swath of the sky. And if you turn around and use a, you know, a powerful telephoto lens on a, on, a, on, a, on a camera, well, then if you're taking a picture of somebody, you might be able to get their eyeball, but you're not going to get anything else. But if I took a wider angle or shorter focal length lens, 
then I'm going to be able to get their face, perhaps their shoulders, and a bunch of stuff in behind them. And the reason I can do that is because, again, that, that shorter focal length offers wider swaths of the sky. So if you're looking to, um, you know, to get that kind of imaging, um, then the first thing you want to, that you want to consider is your telescope focal length. So most small refractors like this, um, for, for the, the diameter of the lens, the aperture, um, 80 millimeter, 70 millimeter, up to about 100 millimeter, uh, is a good aperture. So that's going to take you anywhere, anywhere from basically a three inch to a four inch <coughs> aperture on your telescope. That'll give you lots of light gathering. And, um, and then the focal length of these things are anywhere from this one here. I don't know if I can see it on this one. Probably can I'll have to stand up. Um, let me just open up this tube here because it's right on here. And it's hidden. There it is. So this is 400 millimeter focal length. So 400 millimeters in the telescope world is not a long focal length at all. And because it's such a short tube, it's also very light efficient. So it won't take a whole lot of time to gather photons, to gather light to put onto your, onto your camera. So that's the other thing about going to a short tube telescope is it's very, very light efficient. And again, if you're comparing it to a camera, if you're familiar with cameras, if you go to an F2 uh, <coughs> lens on a camera, well, then it, it'll open up much wider to allow more light in, which means you can take your picture in a much shorter period of time because you have more light gathering power. And so when you go with a short, like a shorter focal length uh, telescope, it's exactly the same thing because it's a shorter focal length. The light path is much shorter, so it's not going to take very much time to get from the lens to the sensor or the lens to your eyepiece. And because it's such a short uh, length, um, you're going to get more light gathering in a faster period of time, which means you're not going to have to have longer, long exposures. So that would be another reason to, uh, to do that for a shorter focal length. Now, to go to the opposite side of the scale, if we were to look at that telescope sitting behind me, that big black one over here, for example, now that one I think has got around a 1600 millimeter focal length. Now, that simply means that um, if I want to use um, uh, to do, say, galaxies, if I want to do um, maybe, yeah, I could probably like do the moon and get a, a decent job on it so I can get up there and get some real fine detail on craters and that. Um, that would be fine. But when I want to start doing larger nebula, unless I'm using a focal reducer on that to shorten the focal length and widen my field of view, um, you're going to be disappointed because you're only going to be able to get sections of this nebula. So then what you end up doing um, is what they call a mosaic, which means you got to take, say, four pictures of it because you're taking pictures of different sections of it. And you could do it that way, but you then you're into four times the uh, four times the uh, the time to take the, the photograph instead of getting a, sh a shorter focal length tube, and you can do it all in one in once in one shot, so to speak. So um, what I want to show you is in, in order to be able to figure out what's the right telescope for me, the first thing you need to do is figure out, do I want to image um, a deep sky, larger nebulosity type objects, or am I more of a solar system type of person? And if I'm a more of a solar system type of person, then um, what would be the appropriate telescope for that? Because solar system objects are very, very tiny. And also, when you're shooting solar system objects, as opposed to the nebula stuff, the solar system objects would also require a different size chip on your camera. Because if you're using um, a DSLR that most of us use, um, you know, when we first start out in the astrophotography, you get your DSLR that you're familiar with. You plunk that into your telescope, and that's how you take your pictures. The DSLR, the sensor that's on it, is actually quite large. And you should be able to see that right there. You can see how large that sensor is. So that's very big. That's a good thing if I want to take pictures of things that are big because I've got a much bigger sensor and I can capture more information on it. However, if I'm doing something like Jupiter, Saturn, uh, some of the tiny, smaller galaxies, or not the galaxies, I'm sorry, super, I put those planets rather, sorry, then I would want to use a camera with a chip size that's that big. And you think you probably think to yourself, well, you're nuts. So why would you want a chip size that big? The reason being, and I'm going to show you here, if you've ever been on um, 
Stellarium. And I think we've seen it enough on this program and we've certainly seen it enough on some of the RAS programs where they talk about Stellarium. I'm just gonna um, get that up and going. Oops, I'm gonna try to get it up and going. And it won't go, I won't go. Let me just see if I can share my screen and maybe that'll help. Okay, there it is there. Um, there. Okay, so you should be able to see Stellarium there now. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go out and let's go to a target. Let's go to um, say the Rosette Nebula. And I'm just gonna come in on that. So the Rosette Nebula is very close to. Uh, I'll, I'll take it out here. It's actually right beside Orion, and this of course is where the Great Orion Nebula is, the Horse Head, and all of those wonderful winter targets. So the Rosette Nebula is a is a relatively big target. So so if you want to figure out um, you know, will my telescope show me everything I can, I want to photograph with that nebula? Well, then if you look over here in the top corner, um, there's a section here that the first two things, one will show you ocular view. So if you just are, are if you're just for observing and you want to see how big something's going to look in your eyepiece, you can go here and then just basically put in your eyepiece. So if I'm looking at a 40 millimeter plossal through a Celestron C11 telescope, this would be my view. That's basically what they're saying. But if you want to see what it's going to look like through your telescope and a sensor, whatever your camera is, you go over this size and you're going to get this square. And what the square is showing you, it's actually showing you um, the field of view of your sensor, so whatever that happens to be. So if you look up here, this sensor here in the top right hand corner, it says EOS 450D which is an APS-C size sensor. So if you've got a camera like the one I just showed you, like a Canon T3i, a T5i, T6i, anything along those lines, that's has the size of the chip that's in there is an APS-C size sensor. And um, so that red square you're seeing right here is in fact the size of that sensor. So then you put that in the top part where your sensor goes. And if it's not in there, you can go into... Um, the uh, the ocular side of this, and I think it's uh, configuration window, and then you can go to um, tools. Search and scripts. It's been so long since I've done this. I don't think I'm in the wrong place. To be honest with you. Scripts, plugins. <coughs> yeah, plugins, and then you go to um, oculars. And you go to configure and then it'll give you this. So all you have to do once you're in here is um, you can either type in lenses, telescopes, sensors. And if the one that yours isn't in there, you simply just hit the add button like this and then um, simply uh, type in whatever your sensor happens to be or uh, if you're using a certain camera. And then it's going to ask you a few questions about your camera. You can look it up online. It's going to want to know the resolution of your camera, the chip size, you know, the size of your of the sensor and so on. So you put all that information in. Once it's in there, then it's in there for good. And then anytime you want to draw it out, you can. So once it's in there, you just close this window off and then you're back to where we were. So that's how I got that 450 sensor in here. That's, so you can go in there and set that up. Then you go in and you put in your telescope. So let's say, for example, I want to put in, say, a Celestron C8 telescope, which is one of the most popular uh, smith cassegrain telescopes out there. It's got a focal length of 2,000 millimeters. So I'm going to go in here, and I've already put it in. So I'm just going to scack around until I find it. And... C8, there it is. So there, so now I've got, I've got the camera size in there that I'm using, my camera sensor from the EOS 450D. And now I've got my telescope in there. But I'm, all, I'm gonna take this and turn off this because there's also lens down here. And what that lens, I'll explain that in a minute. So if I was to say, okay, now I've got my C8. And well, I guess I'm right on the Orion Nebula, we might as well stay with that. So you can see, and I'm gonna blow this up. <coughs> If I try to take a picture of the Orion Nebula with my C8 2000 millimeter focal length powerful magnifying telescope with that particular sensor, which is a large sensor, 
you can see that I can't get all of Orion in there, right? Because the scale is wrong for th this type of, of, um, of astrophotography. So I, I either have to change my telescope or I have to use uh, corrector lenses on my telescope. So if I go down here where it says lenses and I'm gonna add a focal reducer, which is gonna reduce the focal length of my telescope. Let's say I'll use a 6.3 reducer right there. Now I can pretty well fit Orion into that um, sensor. It's still not ideal because I'm not gonna get all of Orion in there, but I could get the majority of Orion in there, no problem at all. Or I could do a two panel mosaic if I wanted to. That's if I'm using a 2000 millimeter telescope. Now, again, we're talking about nebulas and we're talking about big nebulas. Let's now go back to the, um, uh, the little 80 millimeter telescope I showed you before. So let's go to that little 80 millimeter. Let's see if it's in here, I know it is. Photo lenses, 105, looks 80 millimeter, there we go. So here's an 80 millimeter view of that target. And I'm gonna take off that reducer because no reducer. So now look what you can do. So if I use that smaller telescope with that very same camera and I haven't done anything but change the, the focal length because I'm using a, a smaller telescope, look what you can get in there now. You can get all of Orion. You can also get the running man in there. And depending on how you set up your uh, orientation, um, you could also get some of that uh, Pearl Nebula in there, which is that real dark nebulosity. All those three things can fit into that field of view, which you could never possibly get in that C8. And um, so this is kind of important to know. If I wanted even more in there, by using that little telescope, I can put a reducer on. Let's say we go down to um, a point seven reducer foot reducer and now look how much i can get in there <laughs> so you can see i can i can get all kinds in there or the opposite if i want to make that a little bit longer focal length i could actually put a barlow lens on that and uh and times that by two and as you can see now i can get the complete orion nebula in there complete uh with that um with that um uh focal uh, uh with a barlow which is magnifying it. And again, I haven't changed my camera. So as so long as my camera fits uh, into the telescope properly and the sensor um, is large enough, like most people start off again with DSLRs, if I wanna shoot this kind of stuff, I'm gonna use a, a very, very short focal length telescope, like that 80 millimeter one I showed you, and I'm gonna use my DSLR so I don't have to go buy a brand new camera. Now, that's for nebulas. Now, if I wanna do planets, let's look up a planet. And let's, uh, let's say Jupiter, because Jupiter's out now. Jupiter. Okay, so now we're in and we're looking at Jupiter. We're in that little tiny telescope. We now borrowed it by two times, which means that 480 millimeter telescope is now 980 millimeters. It's almost a thousand millimeters, but look how small Jupiter is. So there's no way that you're gonna image that and by the time you blow that up on your computer, so you can actually see detail, it's going to be it's just too small versus the amount of uh, of uh, um, sensor that you have on your um, on your camera. So the first thing we want to do here is I'm going to think differently now. If I'm doing planets, I want more magnification. Let's now go back to that eight uh, C8 telescope. There it is. There. So here we are, a C8 telescope using a two times Barlow and look how much larger Jupiter is now. It's still not large enough, but you can get all of Jupiter. And if all the four moons were lined up uh, right now, tonight, um, one of those moons is actually behind. So you're not seeing it, but you can get all of that in the one field of view and you can get a very, very nice image that way. But if I want close up detail on a planet, well, you know what? I've got to change my sensor and I'm going to show you why. So if I take and uh, go from the camera to a planetary camera, and you, you remember I showed you the small little blue camera that had the tiny chip? Let's put that in there. Uh, just give me a minute and I'll find it.
There it is there. So now I'm using the C8 telescope. I've added a two times Bardo. So instead of 2000 millimeters, I now have 4000 millimeters. It's really magnified. And I've switched to a smaller sensor because now that little Jupiter is actually much more closely filling the sensor than, than, the, uh, than the bigger sensor because it just can't do it. And now when you see planetary pictures like this from the professionals, when they're doing solar system stuff, they're using those really small chips. And they're using them because they need to have the light from that planet fill the chip more. So uh, it's got to be way smaller sensor, and you've got to use way more magnification. So, um, so that would be the difference between using a small chip planetary um, camera and a very powerful telescope. If you're doing solar system, that's what you're going to need. So the C8 with a small chip telescope and perhaps a Bardo. That would be perfect for planetary. If you're doing um, nebulosity, like, a, like we talked about before, the larger nebulas, then you're going to want to use a small telescope with a large chip. So, um, so hopefully this isn't confusing things a lot, but it just again, it kind of gives you an idea of where you may have to go if you decide that I want to take, start taking pictures of the night sky. You'll have to kind of start thinking about what it is it, what is it that I want to image. And um, if, it, if it's planetary and stuff, then I know the road I have to take if that's the road I want to go. If it's uh, nebula uh, and larger uh, objects, then I know the road I have to go with a smaller telescope. But what if you want to do both? If you want to do both, your best bet is going to be um, a C8 telescope uh, because with a C8 telescope, you can, um, you can shrink your, um, your, your field or you can increase your field of view by shortening the focal length. A lot of the CA telescopes today, and I have one I wanted to show you, this one right here, this may not be the right picture, but uh, that there is what they call the evolution um, telescope. This is actually an older picture than the evolution, but a lot of the newer ones have what they call a removable front lens on these scopes. You can take that front lens off, and, or the, the, the secondary mirror off, and you can buy a special lens that will go in there and it'll take that 2000 millimeter telescope right down to about, um, I think it's about 480 or maybe 500 millimeters, which is gonna give you about the right, uh, about the same focal um, field of view rather as that small refractor. But, but you'd have to buy a special lens to be able to do that. So if you had that, plus you had a focal reducer on this side, then you could take that C8 telescope and you could turn it into an F6.3 for some more, uh, a wider field of view, um, but maybe not as wide as you need for those bigger um, nebulas. Or you could put that, that lens in the front, what they call a hyperstar, and then you could actually uh, turn that into the same focal length as your very, very small um, refractor. So um, that's kind of where I'm gonna stop with this at this point. If there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Um, and, I think that's it. There's there's a bunch of other things you can get into, but it would be a whole it'd be a whole topic on on different things to consider. Right now, with the cop, what I want to talk about tonight mainly was on. My stop sharing. There we go. Mainly was on just uh, uh, different types of sensor sizes and different types of telescopes and what it is that you actually want to take pictures of if photography is something that you want to do. That's awesome, Paul. Thank you. Uh, yeah, lots of good topics there. And again, we'll get you back again for... You have to unmute yourself, Chris. Oh, sorry. <laughs> hey, sorry to hear it himself. <laughs> that, that's that's the, way, that's the way my wife likes to hear me right there. I, mean, <laughs> I, put, myself a, I put myself in wife mode. <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice if they had that button? <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice, yeah. They don't have it, though. We're keeping control of that one. Thank you, Paul, for that. That was excellent. We're going to get you back for another talk, of course, on maybe part two of that. Yeah. As you mentioned, absolutely. yeah. Awesome. Yeah, it, it, it can get long, and there's a lot of stuff to consider. But just for the basic things, if you already have a DSLR, then, you know, then just consider the type of telescope. That's all. Yeah. And that's Surprisingly very, enough, a lot of your guide cameras are actually planetary cameras too, right? Absolutely. Yeah, in them, so. yeah. And Stellarium is a great way to uh, to familiarize yourself too with what the views will be. Like that, that's a powerful little program for freeware. Oh, it's amazing. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah. I, I can't imagine. I mean, you, you can do that with that. 
if you have a couple of telescopes, make sure it's going to work. And then, mm. you know, like you've done many times, Chris, is go out and plan your night. You do it all right on Stellarium. And if you have a telescope, you can actually operate your mount and everything with Stellarium too. Right. Yeah. That's true. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Um, right. Okay. So let's maybe we'll get to uh, we got a few photos here to show. Okay. So cool. if we can bring them up, just a second here, I'll get myself brought up on both PCs, I guess. And I'll see if I can share my screen again. And we're going to go to the, in the tunnel again for a second until we get my photos up. I think right here. Now I just got uh, three or four photos here to share tonight. Um, and then we're going to share a couple of other ones as well. Uh, we got this one from Paul Richardson. Uh, Paul says, uh, I would like to share my picture uh, I took at my local soccer field in Dover Park uh, in Dieppe, New Brunswick. August, clear night. That's a, that's a rare one. Good for you. <laughs> uh, yeah. Rare for St. John, not rare, rare for Dieppe, I guess. Uh, this is pretty much my first attempt. We'll go back to the park. Great show, he says. And thanks so much, Paul. That's a great shot. Oh, great shot. Big wow. Dipper, Big Dipper yeah. Yeah. Nice. Very nice. Very nice. And the, that arc to Arcturus, as we talk about, right, right over there. The big bright one there. So if you're looking towards the Big Dipper and you and you turn to the left and you arc the handle back, you'll find Arcturus sitting there. Very nice. Uh, we got this one from Trudy. Trudy Allman has sent us in this one. Uh, says it's a photo which was supposed to be meteor shot, but we know how that went. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so here's the big and little dipper. She says so. Nice, nice capture. Of course, for those who don't know, uh, the Big Dipper, of course, is this way. And, of course, they call it the Big Dipper here in England. They call it the Plough, and Rome is a chariot. It's got different names all throughout the world. But take these last two stars here. We call them these the pointer, pointer stars, and they point directly up to Polaris. There's Polaris right there, our North Star. So these two stars here, right up to Polaris. And from Polaris, we can go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Backwards pot, or upside down pot dumps down into the, little, the Big Dipper. So there's the Little Dipper for those who have, haven't seen it. From our location in St. John, we get to see Polaris and usually these couple of stars right here. We don't usually get to see these ones in between. If you are, if you want to know whether you're in a dark sky site, that's usually a good test right there. If you can see all seven stars that make up the Little Dipper, then you're in a nice dark spot. Um, and also, of course, if you can see Andromeda Galaxy Naked Eye, or you can see the Double Cluster Naked Eye, that also tells you that you're in a nice dark spot. But there's one good key right there. So, And, of course, Polaris is our, our North Star, so it doesn't move. Everything else rotates around Polaris in our sky. Um, but back to the photo. <laughs> and away, and away, away from the astronomy lesson again, as I kind of drift off sometimes. Um, oh, nice. Wow. Here we got one here from Marlene G. Wells. Marlene says, when Green Hill, Nova Scotia gives you the Milky Way, two planets, and a meteor. Wow. Cool. Look at that, eh? So we got oh, Jupiter yeah. Saturn sitting there. There's a nice meteor in the shot. Look at the colors. That's gorgeous. Yeah. Beautiful. Oh, a tree in the foreground, too. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, taken at 12.01 a.m. on August the 12th, uh, taken using an 8 millimeter fisheye at Green Hill Provincial Park. Yes, awesome. Sir. Awesome photo. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for that, Marlene. And I, uh, some of these I grabbed from my Facebook page, too, because I know people post pictures up on my visitor post page. But uh, this, these are from Kim Warren. She said she was setting up and waiting for the Perseids. So here's uh, the big and little dipper again, of course. We were looking off in that direction to, to capture some of the Perseids. Don't know how everybody made out with a Perseid shower. Uh, locally, it was pretty tough. Um, I guess on Saturday or Friday, no, I guess it was Thursday night, I could see maybe 11 of them. Uh, but that was just after our clouds... Uh, dissipated for a short period of time. Some people got to see some really nice ones. Some people got to see a, a huge fireball that passed over us, I guess. And uh, a lot of people reported that fireball as well to uh, to the American Meteor Society, which I suggest to people to do. You can go to the American Cedar, uh, Meteor Society, uh, click on fireball logs, and it'll say report a fireball. You can give them a little bit of information on where you saw it, what direction it was coming from, that kind of thing. And it helps astronomers uh, find out how big these rocks were and uh, what speed they were traveling when they came in through our atmosphere. 
So here's a shot of her set up, of course, looking looking in that direction. There's Cassiopeia sitting there, and Perseus just underneath it. So this is where you want to be looking for the Perseid shower. It's the shower's okay. still on, really, up until the 24th. So you still have an opportunity, and especially on these nights that we have coming up right now, we have hardly no moon at, at all in the sky. Our new moon's coming up in a couple of days. So these are the evenings to get out and take a look uh, because you're not going to have the light pollution from the moon interfering with your view. So although they may be fairly sparse right now, as far as meteors go, um, each night you go out, if you spend a few hours outside, you're going to catch at least two or three meteors anyway. Um, there, there, There's meteor showers that overlap each other. Actually, right now, there are three meteor showers happening at the same time. Just that the Perseids are the most popular because they're the largest show. But... Uh, you still get a chance to see a lot of meteors uh, throughout the month. So if you're out on a new moon night like tonight and you've got a chance to bring your binoculars out and take a look at the Milky Way and stuff, then uh, glance as well in that same direction that you were looking for for Perseus, just off to the left or to the right of Perseus, um, and you should still be able to pick up a few meteors tonight. So that's a good part of the show as well. Um, I guess from here I wanted to go to... Uh, a little bit of discussion around what I had talked about earlier was our new moon contest coming up. And uh, I've got another shoot the moon contest coming up. It's been a very popular uh, contest along the way. So I wanted to introduce our newest shoot the moon and planets too this time around. And uh, I want to uh, first of all say thank you very much to our, our two sponsors this time around, Mr. Babek Stadeki of uh, Next Dome Observ Observatories. And also uh, through uh, John Reed, uh, who's a local uh, amateur astronomer out of uh, Nova Scotia, who's also an author, a local author. And both of these uh, uh, fine gentlemen have uh, offered to uh, sponsor uh, this, this contest coming up. So, a little bit about the contest rules this time around. Well, we're going to ask you to take a photo of the moon, as we had mentioned before, as we had done right along. Uh, basically, take a photo of the moon between Tuesday night which is our new moon cycle, and September the 10th. That's when the contest will end. And submit it here uh, either on my Facebook page or send me uh, an email to uh, Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail.com. You can put it there as well. This time I'm also opening up the contest to Instagram followers. There are a number of Instagram followers that follow uh, our page there. So it's open up to them as well. Um, so now um, to like, you have to like and share the contest for a second chance at winning, and that's, uh, that's a standard uh, thing that we've been running through before. Um, also, you have to either like or follow the page to be able to enter the contest. And again, our two wonderful sponsors have put across uh, these prizes for us this time around. Here we are. So we've got five sets of Tasco 7x35 binoculars, brand new in the package. They're up for grabs, and we've got uh, three books, uh, 50 Things to See with a Telescope Activity Workbook, the 50 Things to See with a Telescope uh, Edition, and uh, 50 Things to See on the Moon. Um, the binoculars have been donated by, uh, by uh, Next Dome Observatories and the uh, 50 Things books, of course, by John Reed. Thank you again for both of you for sponsoring uh, this contest. We really appreciate it. So the new twist this time around um, is not just to uh, capture uh, a shot of the moon, but you can also get a shot of the planets. Now, right now in our evening sky, there are uh, several planets available for viewing. We've got Mars, we've got Jupiter, and we've got Saturn. I think I have a picture here. Here we are. So this is looking southeast at midnight local time. Of course, you don't have to wait till midnight to get out there because these planets come up just at dusk now. So once the, once the sun sets and we're able to see things in our night sky, Saturn and Jupiter are going to be your first targets right there. Sitting right beside Sagittarius in the beautiful Milky Way view. Uh, if you wait until about midnight, Mars is going to be up just above the horizon uh, around 11 o'clock. So Mars will be in a perfect position for a photo. And then... Also, for those of you who are like a morning sky, here we are with our morning sky tomorrow. A uh, waning moon here, just very, very tiny, slim crescent about to slip um, uh, away from our view uh, very shortly. But then we have, of course, brilliant Venus in our morning sky. And Mars is still up too at 5.30 in the morning. So whether you're a morning person or you're an evening person, you have an opportunity now to capture a picture of a planet. I'm not asking for photos like Paul showed there a second ago <laughs> of a beautiful mass of Jupiter with a with the shadow of Io. I don't know if you caught that, Paul, but the shadow of Io was passing across in front of it tonight. Oh, no, I missed it. Yeah. We'll, we'll accept those if they show up. Yeah, if they do, for sure. <laughs> but 
I know people don't all have DSLRs. I know people don't all have telescopes. It's not eliminating anybody from this contest. The idea here is for you to get outside and take a look up. That's that's the whole idea of the contest. It always has been. So I'll take the shakiest photo you have of the moon, uh, your crappiest camera that you that you have to take a photo of. Jupiter and Saturn, again, are very easy to take. So what will happen with the contest is that anybody who takes a shot of the moon will be entered into the one contest as as norm, as per normal. And with the, uh, the prizes that we'll be offering, we'll be offering one pair of binoculars and a book, one of these books, for three winners of the moon contest. The other two pairs of binoculars are going to be for those who enter into the planet contest. So I would suggest that you offer for both. Um, and I probably expect that less people will offer for the planet one, maybe not, hoping that they don't, but if less do, then you have a more of an odds of winning a, a set of binoculars for that contest too. So we've got five uh, nice uh, prizes to give away. I can't wait to give them away, and I'm really looking forward to seeing all your photos. So this is also a reason for you to get out and take a look at where the planets are located in the sky. Right now, prime time for viewing planets. The only planet that we can't view right now is Pluto, which we need the Hubble Space Telescope to see it, and Mercury, which is in superior conjunction, which means it's behind the Sun at the moment. So, But we still have Venus, Mars, Saturn, and Jupiter, all naked eye planets, all visible in our southern sky all, uh, all, all through the week and all through the month. Um, and uh, we've got perfect planet viewing. You've got really nice weather. So get out there and get those photos and submit them. I'll put up a post on the Facebook page uh, probably tomorrow evening explaining all the rules out again and how to enter the contest and where I'd like you to uh, submit your photos. And that's what we got coming up. So that's our that's our moon contest for this go-around. A little bit of a twist. There's Mr. John Reed with his, with his books. And there's uh, Next Dome Observatories with a, an observatory sitting in Iceland. We sent that picture. So very nice. Mm -hmm. So, um, Chris, too, could I yep. just uh, show people what uh, the picture of the moon and Venus? Please. Like with DSLR? Yep. Let me uh, stop sharing here. Yeah. And I think we're back. Okay. Yeah. So let me get on to you here, Paul. So um, share screen. So if you have a regular DSLR, which most people do, or even a, you know a decent little camera, even the pocket phones now will zoom in. Um, you can get a shot like this, which um, which I took at uh, just a little after five o'clock in the morning, out in the middle of the river, sitting in a boat. And this was up in the sky. So it was the moon, a nice crescent moon with Earth shine and Venus. And you can't miss it. As soon as you look up, it's the two brightest things in the sky uh, if you're up that time of day. Now, again, this was, a, this was on Saturday. So uh, I guess that would be yesterday. Mm. So, uh, so the crescent is getting smaller and smaller. But, but it's just that simple. Take your, your, your camera. I only used a... It was like a 100 millimeter lens, which is standard on most cameras. Put it up and point it towards the sky and not shot the picture. And there you go. So it's really that simple. And if you take a shot of the moon and Venus together, you can enter in both contests. There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> all, all, in one, all in one shot. Just have to be up at the right time of day. <laughs> so that's what we've got for contests. I want to, again, thank uh, John Reed and uh, Mr. Sadehi for, uh, for up next home for the, uh, the prizes that are being offered. Uh, and... Um, we have a prize here to give away, too. Mr. Yeah. Paul has a book to give away that we talked about last week called Teach yeah. Yourself Astrophotography. So did you, uh, uh, is there any possible chance that you had put the names in a little hat or something from the uh, photo sub submissions for this week? Um, in the hat for the photo submissions this week? Uh, we only had a few photo submissions this week. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We could probably do that. Yeah, let's do that. Let's let's draw for this. Well, you're searching through that. I'm going to show a, okay, to share a picture. Yep, let me bring you up there, Paul. Or, uh, 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 Mike? Mike? Well, I can Mike. share the screen. It should uh, come no, up. Can, there we go. And yeah, Paul showed you earlier uh, an Orion 80 millimeter uh, acro, which is, you know, 400 millimeter focal length. I just so happen to have the exact same uh, telescope. And I put my uh, DSLR camera on it this afternoon. And I took this picture, of course, using a solar filter. Uh, of the sun. Wow. That was uh, just quickly run out, get it on the sun, get a shot, looking to see if there was a sunspot. Uh, of course, this is cropped. Uh, the original picture is actually zoomed out a bit there, but that's just a quick shot with, uh, a, what are they called, an APS sensor or two-thirds? Yep. 
Yep. And, and an 80 millimeter scope uh, with a solar filter. So, Fantastic. Yeah, it turned out pretty good. It's real. They're real easy to focus using, of course, with a flip up screen. But uh, it was uh, just something quick uh, and a quick example showing uh, the type of scope that you were using or that you showed there tonight uh, with a DSLR camera. So. Perfect. And, and also the uh, the moon and the sun from our perspective are exactly the same size. Right. So you can do that ex same exactly same thing Mike did with the sun that she came with the moon and you can still get the full disc of the moon. Yeah. Okay, Paul, I'm just getting names here uh, made up and tearing them off on a piece of paper here. So we've only got four names here in the draw. That's good. Okay, let me get them torn up here. Everybody's got a 25% chance. 25% chance of winning. And they're kind of... <laughs> <laughs> In the meantime, Paul, uh, I don't, uh, how many people out here know that Paul is actually also an excellent wildlife photographer? Um, yeah, so click on picture, um, I, picture. <laughs> I would like to show you just yeah, just a few photos uh, Paul could share with us of some of the amazing work Paul has been doing. This is National Geographic quality stuff. Like, uh, anyway, Paul's going to bring you up to a few photos that uh, Paul actually goes out in the morning uh, and gets on a, a boat. With some with a buddy, and uh, they run down the uh, KV River, in uh, in the Hampton area, and he shoots uh, shoots wildlife along the river. All right, so well, let's see let's, what I got Let's take here. a look at a few um, photos that Paul has you, uh, captured. Okay, can you see my screen now? Uh, you can, can, yes. Yep. Okay, so um, there we go. This one here, this little guy, is for those who don't know what it is. It's not a it's not a, a prehistoric duck, although that's what it looks like. It's um, it's actually a cormorant, and this little guy just sitting on a just sitting on a post there, and happened to go by. He said, "Look, look at me! Take my picture." <laughs> no idea. <laughs> well, they were kind of neat. They got that beautiful little turquoisey eye, and uh, I found out just by doing some uh, some research that that eye color is only there during mating season. It actually changes um, when when uh, when that season's over for them. So I thought that was kind of interesting. That's cool. Yeah, so there's just a couple of different colors. Here's a cormorant there, and he's actually flying out. Mike mentioned it kind of looks like a like a the Java moose <laughs> logo. Yeah, or, a, or a whale's tail flipping up there. Or yeah. a whale's tail. And he's actually taking off. He's getting ready to fly. The cormorants don't just fly away like a duck does. They actually have to run on the water before they can get uh, before they can get airborne. Um, there's a, whoop, I didn't want to show that. There, this one here um is of course a, a great blue heron and this was just after i took that picture of the moon and venus probably about 45 minutes actually actually the sun came up and he's actually flying towards the sun and um and he's out for his uh, his meal and these guys i'm quite surprised you can get quite close to them on a boat as long as they're not you know making noise and stuff and uh, you can go ahead and take pictures of them catching fish and the whole works and uh, so that's what, uh, that's what this guy eventually ended up doing, was going to get some fish. And there was that moon picture again. And I don't know if there's anything else here I want to show you. Um, I think that was probably. Oh, yeah. And there's um, sitting on the river. Just And that would have been the time that moon and Venus would have been in the sky. And so you can see that the sun is just starting to come up. And you've got what they call the blue hour, which is just a gorgeous, gorgeous blue color that is just, I can't, Mike and I talked about this earlier. You have to be out there on the middle of the river and watch this. And, and I could spend a whole night just watching the stars from up there because everything that you see in the sky is also reflected in the water. And it's just the most magical place you could possibly be, possibly be if it's a clear night and the water's calm. It's just I can't, you know, I can't say enough about it. Another little herring going the other way. And, oh, this little guy here, this is uh, what they call a kingfisher. And these guys aren't really big. They're probably just about three quarters the size of a, of a, uh, a blue jay. But they are, like, super, super fast. And they are so hard to capture with a camera. You, you've really got to practice to get these guys. But I got this guy Saturday morning, and he was flying up a storm. And he just happened to say, here, look, take a picture of me, too, <laughs> just like that cormorant did. So I was really pleased to get that. And that's a little kingfisher right on the KV River. That's the same picture I showed you. And here's one more of uh, that same um, uh, heron. But this was actually um, 
as the sun was coming up. So you can see the sun was just breaking and he's heading towards the sun. And, uh, and uh, I was just so fortunate to get the, the sunlight and the shadowing just right on that photograph. And that turned out really, really well. Oh, beautiful. So, yeah, so those are just a few of the fo fo photos I've taken. And these are the things that I do when I can't do astronomy at night. I get up early and do uh, this kind of photography in the morning. And there you go. That's, I mean, look at that shot right there. That's, I mean, that's a pterodactyl. <laughs> <laughs> it yeah. just is. <laughs> I, I love his eyeball. Like if you could zoom in just a bit on his eyeball. Yeah. That's proof yeah. that dinosaurs existed yeah. for sure. Yeah. Look at this guy. <laughs> He's determined. Can I, can I grab it? Oh, yeah, there we go. Yeah, I think you can. Yeah. Yeah. Look, yeah. That. Look at that. Just. Yeah. So he's a he's a he's a determined guy. He's got his eyeball on something. Oh yeah, and they're you should see how fast. Like that neck is all tucked in when they fly, but when they're actually fishing. Uh, they are, it's just like a, just like a, somebody shoots a gun and bang, their, their neck, it just goes all quick, smashes the water and all of a sudden they come up with an eel or a fish or whatever they're grabbing. They're amazing fishers. I just, <laughs> uh, just read some YouTube comments. Yeah. Paul, those are, those are amazing. Now folks, if you wanted to get a view of more of them, um, you can always go to Paul's Paul Owen, uh, Facebook page. And uh, Paul is going to be setting up a website soon to be offering to be offering these fantastic photos to people. So uh, we're trying to convince Paul into getting getting himself set up on that. Uh, he has so much talent to there to share for sure. I'm uh, reading uh, Trudy's comments. She said, uh, "Figure I'd answer since Chris is busy running around the room looking for a hat for the draw when he has one on his head." <laughs> yeah, but Trudy, I, I never removed my hat from my head, so sorry. <laughs> I sleep with my hat on. Um, anyway, there were I've a got a couple of comments about Paul's hat out there too. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, don't tell me because I'm recording the game, so I don't yeah, know it's, it's somebody's <laughs> off topic, but loving the hat, Paul. Thirteen minutes to puck drop, so yeah. somebody's already oh, warned it about you. Started. Yeah, yeah. No, this, that was a while ago. Sorry. That was seventeen minutes <laughs> yeah, ago. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so I do have a I do have a hat here. Um, actually, this hat is going to be awarded some other time down the road, but these are really nice kind of hats because they. They have containing telescopes. Oh, I got one. I got one. Thank you. <laughs> Wife just handed, handed me one in the door. <laughs> um, the Canadian telescopes hat, and they actually have a little uh, light on the front of them, so you can actually click a little button and a little light up red for really nice for oh, astronomy. Nice. Yeah. So there'll be there'll be a, a later prize. That's also been donated uh, donated by Next Dome Observatory. So there'll be a later prize later today. But I've got four names in the hat. The four that entered the contest tonight or entered the uh, photos tonight. So we'll pick out a name. Okay. Slush around a little bit. Uh, prize will have to be picked up in Hampton, Paul, I assume. Um, is, is everybody local? I'm not sure. I'd have to look that up. <laughs> we'll that <laughs> we, know, we know a couple are. Yeah, get them to send us an email. We'll, we'll get a load of them. Okay. So let's take a look. The winner of the uh, Astrophotography Book. From Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> Marlene Wells. You can see that Marlene. name or not. Hey, right. there it is, Marlene. Okay, Marlene Wells. Congratulations, Marlene. Congratulations, Marlene. Uh, just to let you know, Marlene, with that fantastic work you were doing with your DSLR in this astrophotography book, there is a whole section designated to DSLR photography for Milky Way, for um, uh, star trails, for constellations, all kinds of great stuff in this book. Uh, and that's just perfect for you. So congratulations. Excellent. Thanks, Absolutely. Paul. Nice price. Very nice price. Okay, you know we're getting into we're into all, we're into an hour and twenty seven minutes. So I don't know if we got any time to talk about what's up this week. But there's a couple of things I would just mention is the fact, of course, the new moon's coming up uh, right now. Uh, so we'll be by Tuesday. We'll be in a new moon phase. And uh, I'm just going to talk about a couple of things. Just a second here. Oh. Uh, yeah, I just had brought, I brought up a couple of notes here, just saying that on uh, August the 21st to the 22nd, that's the real good night uh, for Jupiter viewing. So that would be Friday night into Saturday, because on Friday into Saturday night, we're going to have another double transit happening. Um, I don't know if I can get uh, the window up here. You know, I don't think I'll bother. I could open story up and show it, but uh, just be keep an eye out for our, our new moon. Right now is a perfect time to be outside doing your viewing for... Uh, for night sky viewing because we've got uh, 
no moon in the sky basically you can still pick up a few perceived meter meteors from the from the shower uh, currently our new moon starts again on tuesday night i think we've got a uh one percent or less moon on tuesday night which is always a really cool target hey mike to yeah. uh, to try to pick up uh pick up the uh, the moon just before it sets and see if you can get a very slim tiny little crescent moon on that and that'll be your first that'll be your first entry for the moon contest but also uh Look ahead for those few nights for the Milky Way views. Uh, Jupiter and Saturn, of course, in their evening sky. Mars is up now. We're going to be uh, up close to Mars on in October. We'll have it at opposition. Uh, last year, I think I remember some people posting photos of Mars shining on the water in uh, in on the Bay of Fundy. Uh, I think it was oh. in St. Martin's. Yeah, so it was. It'd be that bright again. And it should be that bright Venus right now, too. But Venus is uh, a little bit hard to catch because Venus is coming up in the morning sky right now, just before the sun. So... Uh, that might be a possibility as well, but also look look towards uh, Friday and Saturday night. I'll put a post up on my Facebook page about that double transit coming up. There is a transit happening right now. There's a whole pile of them. Actually, the next couple of weeks are right full of transits across to Jupiter, because uh, Jupiter's in prime spot right now. All the all the moons are in the right location right now to be able to offer us transits. What I mean by a transit is basically you have the planet Jupiter. A moon passes in front of Jupiter. It leaves a small shadow on the planet. And at times, you can actually get two of the moons passing in front of Jupiter, so they'll both leave a shadow. That's what's going to happen on Friday night leading into Saturday. I'll put a little uh, post up on the Facebook page about that as we get closer to that throughout the week. But don't forget, these are beautiful, warm August evenings. Great time to be out underneath the stars. Lots happening out there all the time. All the planetary viewing right now. Grab your binoculars. Take a look at, at Jupiter. Take a look at Saturn. Saturn will appear as an elongated shape. Jupiter, of course, you can pick up Jupiter and four little tiny dots beside it. Those will be the moons. Look through the Milky Way at the beautiful Sagittarius star cluster. Lots of clusters of stars. Heading right over top of your head, look down to the big W shape of Cassiopeia. Just below Cassiopeia is a beautiful double cluster. In Pegasus, you'll find the Andromeda Galaxy. There's all kinds to look at with just binoculars. And, of course, when the moon pops up, take a look at binoculars uh, with, the, with the moon through binoculars. Um, it's just a stereo view. We've got two telescopes joined together, basically. You can pick up lunar craters. You can pick up mountain ranges on the moon, these large dark areas we call Maria. There's all kinds of features to pick up on the moon. And while you're out there doing that, get your photo. <laughs> yeah. So. And if, for those who were wondering if winter's coming, if you get up early morning and uh, try to get that picture of Venus, as of this weekend, Sirius is rising in the morning, which is the brightest star in oh, the northern hemisphere. Oh, you're, you're serious, are you? Uh, I'm dead curious. Yeah. Stop calling me sure. It may be disappointing <laughs> to some people, but winter is coming. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. those star parties that we used to attend, and then we'd find we'd find uh, we'd watch Orion rise in the morning, and it was kind of depressing in a way, but it was kind of nice to see it at the same time. But we knew that winter was getting close, right? So. Yeah. We are headed that way. Okay, well, I guess that's probably, guys, we've, we've squeezed a lot of material in tonight's show, <laughs> I'd have to say. Um, so if I could just take a second here and organize myself, get my new contest rules out of the way. And my photos, uh, we've done our photo submissions tonight. So I guess uh, we'll get to our closing notes. And so I guess uh, in closing tonight... Uh, I'd just like to thank all of you again for your, for your continued support out there. We've had a lot of fun with this. We've been over 40 weeks at this uh, this endeavor, <laughs> this well, comedy well, show. Let's just do it for until March. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah it that, that's, what we were, like that's what we were talking, right? But let's do it to March and we'll stop then. Um, <laughs> anyway, we started back, back in October. We're into August now, so we're almost a year into the show. Uh, but we've, had, we've covered some pile of topics, I think, uh, and I think yeah. we've tried to keep them as simple as possible for all of you as well. So we want to say thank you for all of you, for all of your continued support all through this uh, this adventure of ours. Uh, we are going to get back to live streaming, which is kind of the reason why we started this Sunday Night Astronomy Show in the first place, um, was the idea that we could offer live streams of galaxies and star clusters and planets and things. Uh, we can, I can look out the window right now. I mean, we're a little bit later right now, but uh, it is dark right now. But we're waiting for darker skies to, to start arriving. As they do arrive, we are going to be offering a whole lot more live streams. Uh, Mike has a, an observatory in his backyard. Uh, Paul has one as well. Uh, I just sit here and pretend I have one. <laughs> 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 and I offer their views. That's what I do with this astrophoto. I don't take astrophotos. Astro I take Paul's photos and share them. It's just, just as well. <laughs> 
Uh, but anyway, that's that's what the idea of coming up uh, in our fall months, in our winter months, of course, to carry us through the winter. But uh, we're just glad that we were able to bring it, uh, bring something through it, uh, to uh, all of this pandemic going on and try to keep your spirits up a little bit more. So again, uh, we do love getting your photos. So uh, please send them in to Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail.com. That's the address. It's all one word, Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail.com. And we'd, be love, we'd love to put them up on the next uh, broadcast for sure. Also, please consider entering uh, the upcoming contest for a chance to win some nice, really nice prizes there. Uh, the contest will start on Tuesday night uh, with the beginning of the new lunar cycle, and it'll end on September the 10th. So we have lots of time and lots of clear nights, I'm sure. <laughs> Every time I run a contest, it's about 95% cloudy nights, but uh, I might guarantee that we're going to have some clear nights, so we're good. Uh, we're also looking for suggestions for topics, too, for future shows. So if you have a topic that you'd like us to talk about, uh, be it uh, something about the night sky itself or how to capture that decent photo or how to do something or how to build something, let us know because we're, we're running out of ideas. <laughs> no, really not. We, we always have ideas to come up with, but uh, we love your input and we want to be able to make sure that, that you're getting uh, what you want out there as well to stay with us. So so uh, any ideas that you have for for uh, future shows, just send them out to my Facebook page or Instagram or send them through the, uh, the email address that I suggested there. And uh, we'll look at your requests and see if we can possibly do something for them. Uh, we also ask that if you uh, enjoyed the content here tonight, that you'll uh, continue and you joined us uh, from YouTube, that you would subscribe and uh, like uh, the uh, the show as well. And uh, from that on, I guess, guys, that's uh, that's we're going to call that an evening. So uh, from Mike and Paul and I, we'd like to say uh, stay safe, everybody out there. Have a great week. Uh, we wish you all clear skies. And uh, like we like to say, guys, uh, keep your scopes pointed up. up. Perfect. Thanks, folks, for joining us. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, another great night. And uh, yeah. <laughs> don't forget. <laughs> and we hope to see you all again here next week at the same time, same channel. Take care, folks. Good night.